On today's show, the tale of Minnesota's grasslands and their impact on climate change. Plus an aha moment turns a non-hunter into a mentor afield. And we help you get ready for Christmas by decorating with the outdoors. Minnesota Bound, presented by Kinetico Water Treatment Systems. Hi everybody, Bill, Millie and I welcome you to Minnesota Bound. Into those treats today, aren't sure you? sure is. <laughs> <laughs> Up first today, you know, climate change continues to hit headlines almost daily. And as Ron Shera explains, one small resource can make a big difference. Looking out on the native prairies of Minnesota, the state's rarest landscape. Most of us see waving grasses, wildflowers, and well, not much more. But that's not what Greg Hoke sees. He sees help in reducing climate change. Grassland restoration can be one of, of several different things we can be doing, but it, it can be a, a fairly powerful tool. We need to put less carbon into the atmosphere and we need to take more carbon out of the atmosphere. When prairies pull carbon out of the atmosphere, they stick it down in the ground. As long as that ground is not plowed up, it's down there pretty much permanently, or at least at the scale of thousands to tens of thousands of years. Who knew? Grasslands so valuable for clean water and wildlife habitat will also impact climate change. We are learning. We've got some cultural and social hurdles to get over. We plowed up the prairies, we converted it to corn and soybeans, we produce a lot of commodity crops in the state. Some of the more interesting research coming out in recent years has been looking at what's called precision agriculture. Farmers today can figure out basically square foot by square foot what their yield is. Research studies recently in Iowa showed that farmers are losing money on about 6.2 million acres of land every year just because of the input costs versus the productivity. Now imagine if at most Iowa had about 2.1 million acres of CRP. We could triple the amount of acres in permanent grass in a place like Iowa or like Minnesota. Historically, however, our view of grasslands in Minnesota, Iowa, and elsewhere saw only one purpose, to plow and to plant. We're never gonna go back to the 1700s. We do need to eat. We need to eat ourselves. We need to feed other people. This is one of the best places in the world to do that. And we've set the table in a big way. Minnesota once had an estimated 18 million acres of prairie grasslands. Today, almost 99% is gone, with about 249,000 acres remaining. Indeed, the urgency for more grasslands is not just about pheasants or songbirds. What grasslands do is they hold water. We talk about prairies being sponges. Just over an acre of, of tall grass prairie will capture 53 tons of water. So if you want to reduce flooding, you can strategically and in a targeted way restore grasslands and the embedded wetlands. When the water's not running off horizontally, it's soaking in. So it's recharging the groundwater, recharging the aquifers, protecting drinking water supplies for nearby cities. Clean water, reduce flooding, reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So where are the advocates for more grasslands? Where's Minnesota's ag community? Where's the legislature? Where's the governor? I ask myself that question quite often. There is a lot to talk about that. Um, again, and we have the biology, we have the science. A lot of people think that, you know, pretty much, you know, everything should be growing corn and soybeans. Some of us think there are, you know, could be other things that we could be doing. With careful grazing, with careful haying, they can still be fully integrated into an agricultural economy, just not being planted, you know, to corn and soybeans dissed up every year. At the moment, grassland advocates like Greg are pretty much lone voices, but not without hope. 
at this point in time, it's a communication. We need to show people the benefits of this. Planting grasslands and restoring wetlands has been shown to be very, very effective at removing nitrates from surface waters and groundwaters. Now we've turned grassland conservation into a human health issue. Now we've started building a much larger coalition of individuals who are interested in grassland conservation, even if they don't like to chase pheasants around in the fall. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, Rapala, Midwest Exteriors MN, and by Ice Castle Fish House and RV. Up next, Travis Frank introduces you to a Minnesotan making a difference. Kang Yang plays the role as a hunting mentor, but his journey may surprise you. Kang Yang has a bird dog. This is Kaya. She's a German wirehead pointer. And plenty of hunting gear. To most, he looks like an ordinary pheasant hunter. But to his friends, he's extraordinary. I just want to be out here. That's Alex Grein. I'm from Germany, from the Münsterland. Alex moved to America more than a decade ago, but he's never hunted here or harvested a Minnesota pheasant. Zero. I'm here to change that today, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks to Kang, he finally has a good chance. He needed somebody to help him show how to basically access Minnesota, where to go, and just the simple stuff, like where to park, you know, and what kind of shells can you use. There it goes. Head, head. See, Alex, they exist. We're hunting public land today. These are wild birds, and they're super hard to hunt. <laughs> if I get a bird today, you'll probably see me yell and jump a lot. And then it like pretty abruptly stops for me. And I, I mean, I've just taken an animal's life, which I don't really take easy. Kang shares Alex's excitement and his hunting perspective. Head, head, head. Beautiful. It's the whole, the whole journey just to get that one rooster. That feeling is just great. That feeling inspired Kang to launch an online group to recruit new hunters. He started this group on Meetup, and I was supposed to look up a play group for toddlers, but you know, I was like, let's track hunting first. <laughs> and that's how I met him. Meetup is just an app that you know you create groups with people of similar interests, and that group I created for basically new hunters. I met each person one on one or in groups, and you know, giving them like the layout of how hunting works, you know, basically getting your firearm safety first taking them to the gun range, you know, getting them comfortable with a shotgun. When they're ready, he takes them hunting. There's a lot of people that show interest already in that group. A lot of women, a lot of Indian people. <laughs> yeah, which was really interesting. And then also hunters who want to get back into hunting. Hunters just like Alex. Here goes, 10. <laughs> Whoa. Man, I just love that sound when they flush. <laughs> like this. That's awesome. The number of hunters are declining, and so this is just my way of giving back. He's like so into it, and I was like, when he told me, oh, I've only been hunting for three years, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Kang's mentorship mission surprises nearly every hunter he meets. Yeah, I was an anti-hunter. His hunting views changed thanks to that dog right there. Yeah, she's the reason I hunt. Kaya was a gift from Kang's father that ultimately changed his life. You know, I got her home and I was like, what am I gonna do with this dog? He began training her, then he watched Kaya's hunting instincts grow. You know, wanting her to be outdoors, spending that time with her. And so I was like, well, I might as well start hunting. I call myself an anti-hunter turned hunter. His friends call him their hunting mentor. Hen, hen, I'm feeling so alive right now. <laughs> And then being a hunter, you make the connection where this animal is giving you food, right? And by harvesting this animal, you're also giving back, uh, you know, with your time and money and conservation, making more of them. The number of pheasants and ducks we see wouldn't be here without hunters. That's when I kind of had that like, aha moment. That aha moment now impacts new hunters by taking them 
into Minnesota's wildest places and planting seeds in their souls. That feeling is just great. The cool part about today is like just how open this land is here. This America as I expected it to be. A landscape that's open to us all, providing a shot at harvesting a wild bird. I think the biggest thing I've learned is not expecting to get your limit or expecting a bird, just to enjoy the moment that you have now with your dog and your friends and your family. Kang Yang's open invitations turn ordinary hunts into extraordinary, life-changing moments. Still ahead, a family pheasant hunt to remember. But first, we help you get ready for the holiday season. Closed captioning provided by Star Bank. celebration outdoors to your patio, front door, or porch. And I'm here with Jan Winterhalter from Otten Brothers Nursery, and she's going to show us how to do our own DIY holiday pots with some things right from our own backyard. Jan, I'm so excited to get planting. Thank you. <laughs> what are the first steps to getting started? First you need to fill up your pots with some soil, but it takes up a lot of soil, so let's put some liners in the bottom. Take these empty pots, which you use as liners, and you layer them in the bottom to use up the space so we don't need as much soil. And the next step, let's get these pots filled up with soil. It's a dirty job, but it's a fun one. Fill it up almost to the rim. Get rid of the, the soil chunks. A dirt massage. Our pots are full with soil. Well, you need to, to gather up some ideas of what you want to have inside your pots. There's so many opportunities in your yard to grab from. You have your dried hydrangeas. You have crab apple branches. You could grab sumac. The thing that I don't recommend is going up to your Colorado spruce and grabbing a branch, because that's not going to regrow. You're going to really damage your tree. I encourage you to go into a retail environment and buy some bundles. You want to start in the center of your pot. You want to get some height. We don't know how long these have been sitting in the retail environment. So you need to snip them back. We need them to suck up some water to remain green and healthy through the whole winter season. Once you're done with that, you take it and you stick it into your pot. And I would do that and add two or three more around, add other fillers as we go to make some design, texture, color, whatever, whatever your eye is attracted to. So you can just get creative and kind of decide whatever you want to put in your pot at this point? Absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna, I love pine cones, so I'm gonna go with this big guy. And this is a crab apple tree from the backyard? Yes, it's actually from the front yard. So we would like to use some filler in the bottom, like some greenery to drape around. One item that you haven't used yet is the red, red twig dogwood that is found very well in the, in the backyard. Now, do I have to water this pot in the wintertime, or how does that work? If it's, we still have days that things do not freeze yet, I suggest you water them once a week. And once it freezes, how often does it need to be watered? You're done watering. Laura, one thing that I really love to use from the backyard is texture and the neat burning bush that you can get from your yard. Clip off a branch and bring it into your pot. Voila! They look beautiful. Thanks, Jan, for your help today. And make sure you think outside the pot and get creative with things from your own backyard this holiday season. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Radco Truck Accessories, White Bear Lake Superstore, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing.
Up next, family hunts always create special memories. My sister Simone and my nephew Jake head out to South Dakota pheasant hunting with my dad, Ron Shera. Jake, you go ahead and stay right around the tall stuff, okay? We'll have mom go in the center. So where's the bird? Stay around us, rooster! Get away, good teamwork. <laughs> you both hit it. I don't know who shot first, but you both hit it. Oh, nice. But let's pause this pheasant hunting tale for a moment. Why? It's a very special memory. Location, South Dakota's Hidden Hills Lodge. Host, Laurie Sanderson. Got another bird in here? Find us a bird. Where's the rooster? And there's me, blazing away. <laughs> good shot. That's good that you speed him up with that first shot. <laughs> Did I touch him at all the first shot? I don't know. We got a second shot. So what's so special? It's these two. Daughter Simone, grandson Jake. As time passes, you soon realize that sharing a field with family is, well, a moment to remember. Simone and Jake lead busy lives. Sometimes it's tough to find time together. So you cherish the chance. If you're a father, or grandfather, you probably understand. Or if you simply have good friends afield, the feeling's the same. Okay, now we'll go right. We'll go over to the trees. They like this area too. That felt pretty good. That was fun. Hunt him up. There it is! Rooster! Get him, run! <laughs> okay. You know, we have a rule here. If the camera doesn't see it, it didn't happen. So sometimes if the camera did see it, it still didn't happen. I'm referring to that lousy shot I just made. You, you'll understand. Simone's shooting eye was right on. Rooster! Yeah! That was me! Yeah, I know. Finally. It is special, it's making memories. He's 17 and you just know that the horizon is where he's gonna be leaving and going off to college, so I just cherish these moments and we don't really have very many of them. I think it's fun cherishing a lot of memories. She's a big name in the hunting world. She's really established a name for herself and I'm proud to be hunting right next to her and what she represents for the women of hunting. When I got here and we saw the lodge, I was like, well, it's a big lodge. They're very welcoming. They definitely make you feel like family. The meals are wonderful, the breakfast, and I woke up this morning with the smell of cinnamon rolls, caramel rolls in the air. That's a good sign of a good day. At Hidden Hill, a good day also means good hunting. Shoot it! There we go. I guess she was birdie. Good shot, Jake. Thank you. Yes, a family that hunts together also, well, <laughs> has minor disagreements. You're welcome. I got that one. Yeah, I did. I got him. We I I what? What are you doing over no. there shooting? That was all me. <laughs> I hate to tell him I got that one. No, I got him. No, I did. We all got him. I think we all three shot at the same time. Yep, but I hit him. Nope. Gosh, even family squabbles afield seem enjoyable. Always special memories when it comes to hunting with your family. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> well, that about does it for us. We hope to see you back here next week, right, Millie? And in the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.